Network Automation Nerds Podcast. Hello and welcome to Network Automation Nerds Podcast, a podcast about network automation, network engineering, Python, and other interesting technology topics. I'm your host, Eric Cho. Today on the show, I am very excited to talk to Ken Salenza, VP of Professional Services at Network to Co. VP. <laughs> if you have been following NTC, you know it's one of the most exciting startups in the network automation space, one of the longer ones too. And if you have been following this podcast, you know we have already had several guests from NTC on the show, including Adam on uh, network testing, including uh, Jason, who was, has this you know like journey and founding path. So now Ken will make it three, and that's the, the most of any one single company. So I'm very excited to, to do that. When uh, I talked to Jason, he mentioned uh, he mentioned he met Ken even before he started Network to Code and hashed out the idea of this company. So uh, so Ken has been with the company from day one. And uh, don't be fooled by Ken's VP title. He's super technical and Network Giga heart. And we'll be talking to Ken about his journey, but also about this unique space that he labeled application dictionary. I know I will, and I, I know you will learn a lot from Ken. So let's dive right in. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks. Appreciate you having me on here. Just one yeah. quick quick correction, because I'm I'm one of those purists where I can't take credit. Of course. Of wasn't. course. Um, I actually joined Network to Code probably about a year after. Your really? Year after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very early, like, you know, I'm like the, the longest employee and all, but uh, I can't take credit for being a founder or something. So I'm, I'm always... <laughs> Uh, well, well, we'll have to change that, though. You know, I, I'm sure you have enough equity in there. And um, <laughs> well, you know, I think I think Jason credits you for you know hashing out this idea because it kind of validated his thinking, right? Like it's always been lonely, and you're you're in your basement thinking about this idea, <laughs> and it's it's helpful to hash that with another person. If I remember correctly, he mentioned you guys met at a wedding, right? Like somebody else's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Even better, and I'll, and I'll um, you know uh, advocate for anyone to listen. Oh, to please it. do, please do. Sorry, uh, you know the best, but no, we actually technically met at a bachelor party. Uh, just oh, kind of <laughs> nice. Fun. And um, you know, I'll I'll leave it to him. I'll leave it to to have a call back to to, to view the other episode. Uh, but but did, did justice. I I personally enjoyed, you know, taking the the walk through memory lane, as it were. So. But yeah, yeah. So we, we had met in, in um, you know, at the bachelor party. And then within like six months, I was working for him, essentially. Is uh, that right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe seven, but that, that was about it. About yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, we won't, we won't mention what's happening at the bachelor party. You know, whatever happened there, we stay there. But yeah. somehow between all the excitement, you guys found time to talk about network automation. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, that's not what I would talk about at the bachelor party, but... Apparently, you guys did so. All, all the better for the community. You know, yeah. we all benefit from <laughs> from this uh, gesture you did. But I mean, I feel because I mean, we we've actually met in person too, yeah. right? Like, what a novel idea! We actually shook hands and yeah. met in person <laughs> yeah. um, a couple of years ago at Ansible Fest. Um, so even though that was our only encounter, but because I've been following your path for so long, I feel like we're old friends. I don't know yeah, if that yes, even yes. makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we met, but you know, we, 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 as you know, um, uh, you know, for the for everyone else, we, we, you know, we always keep on contact on Slack and everything else, and just you know, as as things pop up, just uh, you know, a friendly uh, hello here or there, whatever, whatever it may be. So yeah, uh, I feel the same. Yeah, I mean, and especially when we talk, when I talked to Adam, you know, he mentioned a lot of the work that you've done and I feel, and, and we've actually agree on the show. We, we volunteer you oh. <laughs> to be on the show because, you know, it's just so it's instrumental for you to be here and it wouldn't be the same without you. So I am glad you were able to make the time. I know you're super busy talking to customer, trying to make money. So don't let me stay in the way. Uh, but I would, I would love to chat with you about your journey and all of that. So, Let's start from the beginning. How did you get into yeah. technology and how did you get into Python? Yeah, I mean, you know, the secret is, is you know, I, I probably just uh, inceptioned you, influenced you to get me on here just so I could tell this story. So please um, do, please do. Enlighten us. No, I, I know I, I didn't prepare anything, but um, uh, but no, um, you know, in, in high school, I, I, I took uh, programming and, um, you know, I, I kind of enjoyed it. And so uh, yeah. when I was going to the Air Force, um, I want to go become a programmer. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, um, there, there's a test, it's called EDPT. 
And, you know, um, I go to take the test and they're like, you can't study for it. And I failed it by one or two questions or something like that. So I actually couldn't become a programmer in the Air Force, but um, they're like, hey, why don't you become this? And, it, and, and basically it was like a more of like a systems engineer. If you're for an old Air Force person, it's, you know, uh, uh, not a tech controller. I was just, you know, comm systems, essentially. Yeah. Um, free CO, as, as, as I more accurately remember it. Um, so I got in the Air Force. So I, I, I was going to go to the Air Force. I didn't actually get to get a programmer, but I started hearing about, you know, kind of systems and, 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 and so forth. Um, and so I went to tech school and, and, you know, it's kind of cool. Like they teach you like all, all, all different systems, like, you know, what is Linux, what is Unix, you know, just the, the whole gamut, you know. Um, and, you know, you, look, you kind of briefly go over networking and so forth. And um, so I get to my first first my first base and uh, I'm there for a little bit and, you know, kind of there's this old messaging system was kind of maintaining, doing some help desk work and that yeah. stuff. And I was working, it was like 12 hour shifts. Um, so one night, you know, I, I come home uh, or, you know, after, after working, I, I come back and, um, you know, maybe two or two hours into it or something like that when I was home, phone rings and uh, I, you know, groggily answer the phone and, you know, it was my like, you know, master sergeant or something. It's like, do you want to take this training for, for Cisco? And I, I kind of knew about it and I was talking to the tech controllers um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. And they're like, here's the catch. You got to leave right now and go to the <laughs> and, 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 Just like any military guy, right? I mean, you just got to leave right now making like, five right connection yeah. flights. Yeah. But, but the funny thing is, is I was very low ranking and, and they went highest ranking to lowest. And I was literally in, in, in you know, my first duty station for less than a year. Yeah. And really what happened was people just didn't answer the phone. <laughs> I love the commitments. You're the sucker who answered the phone. I was, but like to me, like. The joke was, is on them though. The joke's on them, you know. Like yeah. I, I always took the, you know, I always had the mindset of like, um, I'm not going to, I saw a lot of people kind of get used by the military. I'm, like, yeah. I'm going to use them. And like they set it up so that you could, you can use them. You can like really take advantage of their services and so forth. Sure. If, if you're willing to, like, if you're going to put in the extra effort, you know, on the job training, like they're, they're very willing to let you do things. Yeah. And so it was like, and it was perfect for me because it was like, um, it was like a six week CCNA course and, and not just a six week CCNA course. It was like, it was half days, but like, that was just one of four classes they had for just to get the CCNA. Oh, okay. But for like a teenager, you know, it's just literally a teenager. That's kind of the pace I needed at that time to kind of, to kind of learn it. Yeah. And I, I, I spent the first two weeks just feeling like I have no idea what they're talking about. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. It was just like, they kept talking about VLANs and they're saying, there's a tag on it. There's a tag on it. And it strips a tag off. And I'm like, you keep saying that word as if it's going to mean something to me. <laughs> right. It's still meaning nothing to me. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, I was very lucky to like um, just kind of timing wise in that had a, a great teacher just kind of show up there, like literally just as I was starting, she showed up uh, and I'll, I'll credit, credit her. Uh, I think it was Amy Jerry uh, is, is her name. And she, I don't remember exactly what she said, but she just said something to me. And I was like, Oh, it's a tag. I get it now. <laughs> like what's, as opposed to 10,000 other times, the other instructors yeah, said it's tags. Just, it's just the, the right framing, the right messaging, whatever it was, it was just like the right drawing or, you know, you know, it's just maybe yeah. like depicting yeah. the packet and showing like, okay, now it's without it. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it just hit me. And then everything, you know, like in some kind of like matrix thing started making sense. And it's like, oh, I know what you're talking about for this other thing. And like things started kind of falling into place for me. And it's like, uh, I, I think like there was like the first, there was like a test every two weeks. Yeah. And I, I barely passed the first test because I was just like, oh man, like, um, and then by the next test, I was just like, you know, you know, almost, you know, got all, all the answers correct and everything. Yeah. And, um, so, so went through that and I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Cut to six weeks later. Well, they're doing part two of this. Yeah. Well, who's taking one? <laughs> I feel like we even take the course. So, yeah, I, yeah. You know, and and the, the the deal I was making with the devil was like I basically had to work extra. Like it was like in addition to my work, I had like it was not really at night per se, but like I had to work extra. Like you know, like I would have my normal hours, and then I also had to work here. Yeah. 
but I was fine with it. So I, um, uh, so I, you know, I go through, I, I, I take the class, um, and I'm, you know, I'm really getting it and so, and so forth. And, um, by the time three is coming, the, the, you know, the leadership's like, you're not going back. You, <laughs> it's out, you know? So I was like, no problem. And I just, just got my CCNA like right there, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I was like still a teenager, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I just turned 20 or something like that when, when I got my CCNA. And then, um, I changed bases and I was like, oh man, I have to start all. And I, you know, what, while I was at the first base, I kind of worked my way into a group that was like kind of cross functional. It was systems yeah. and, you know, so great, great there. So then I went to the next base and, um, I'm like going back to like the, like, you know, like, uh, this old messaging system, a little bit of help desk. I'm literally there. It's my first day. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to study for my CCMP. Nice. I put my CCMP book out. Two hours into it, guy walks by. And he's like, whose book is this? I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> I'm explaining it to him. And yeah. he's like, okay, you know, no idea that he's about to get a CCIE. I have no idea who he was or anything like that. Yeah. But he was just, you know, like the next day I get a tap on the shoulder. Do you want to come to the networking team? I'm like, uh, do I ever, you know, like. And- <laughs> Um, so I go, I, you know, went in there and like I said, he was, he was another airman, pretty much the same age. You know, he would have a CCA in a few years. Another guy got a CCA while I was there and it was just a great, great crew. Just like super smart and in Ramstein, Germany, just the entire, the entire team was just very strong, you know? Um, and so I quickly, you know, w- within a few months, like of, of just being a network engineer, yeah. um, one of the contractors came back and he's just like, Hey, I have this idea. We're going to take this PHP. We're going to take the 10 variables that generate over L2 switches and we're going to generate configurations. And I was mm. like, Oh, yeah. I was just coding, you know, like not by a year or two ago. Like, this just, this just makes sense. And it's like, Oh, I don't have to import everything. There's no, you know, type validation and all, you know, like, and so I was like, Oh, PHP is so much simpler. So, that was the start of me, like, you know, as PHP, Perl, and stuff like that. So it was like very early on, I was just like, okay, I'm going to script this. Um, now, the rub for me was, you know, and I'll, I'll jump all the way ahead in the next 15 years where I was just. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, I got out of the Air Force. So all of us have got to, you know, you know, work different jobs, consulting, you know, yeah. working in Z. But during that time, I was just always the one person scripting. Maybe I have one or two other people to to, you know, but no one talked to me about best practices. Right. And I really didn't like, I knew programmatic logic, but I didn't know, you know, what I would call proper automation. Yeah. Were you still using pro at that time or? Yeah. 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 I, you know, I was, um, you know, I probably, you know, I took Kirk Byers first Python class and that was, I did too. Yeah. Did you? Okay. Yeah. I, I I believe I was like the first person to email him back on like the survey because Okay. Just happenstance, like he emailed, and I like emailed back like <laughs> in twenty minutes or something like that. So. Oh, oh, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't take the very first class. I, I what I meant was I did take Kirk's class as well, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, both yeah. the free and the paid version. But oh, okay. you're saying you're like the the very first engineer who like Kirk. I, I'm I in. So I I think they <laughs> confirmed. I I had pulled the email up and like you know you know tweeted about it. You know if you were right. dredged through it, but um you know, maybe someone got me beat. But I you know I remember just happened to. Most times I wouldn't catch email for whatever reason. I just happened to say, I was like, oh, let me just, you know, the guy's been nice enough to develop free content. Let me, um, you know, respond back to him. Sure. Um, and that was like my first kind of, you know, you know, time kind of switching over to Python. But it was still mostly Perl, to be honest. Yeah. It was still right. most Perl for me. Um, you know, other than white space, you know, it was, it wasn't too, too bad of a transition. And, you know, really understanding what object oriented means and, and, and all that fun stuff. Um, yeah. But like I said, you know, it's, you know, 15 years or something like that. And just ran it, ran, ran into Jason. And, and you know, I'll, I'll, like I say, like, uh, you, you'll hear a better story from him than, than me. Um, I, I don't know. He's married now. So I, I don't know if her purview to, <laughs> to listen to those stories. <laughs> well, yeah, it, 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 you know, if, if people know me, like, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I tend to just keep going and going and rambling yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you get me going and you know, the one thing I'll, you know, that he said it was, um, which is the most accurate thing was just like, and this guy's like, oh, I'm never, you know, like, oh, I'm, you know, I do what you do. And I was just like, this is just some chump. Like, he's just. Exactly. Like, That's what he said. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's just like, no, no, I think you're doing like Linux kernel, like, 
you you know UDP streams and TCP <laughs> streams. There's no way you're like managing Cisco devices. Right? That was it. Yeah, it's like when you, I usually just think help desk or local IT, and like they they wire you know like because I've had these conversations and they you know it, 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 like I, I no it, it's not be, uh, disparaging, but there's you know you can't talk too much. It's just like you're, you're dealing with help desk. I, I get it, but yeah. like you're not gonna. But then I started telling him, I was like, yeah, that's what I do. And then he started like probe. And I was like, oh, he actually knows. And then, um, you know, for me, the key was like when I went home, uh, I, you know, I, you know, I, you know, Googled him and all that fun stuff. And I saw his blog. I'm like, I've read this guy. I actually know who this guy is. I'm like, <laughs> so, nice. but yeah. Yeah. He was like, I, I can't remember. Was it 1PK or something like that's just super old and then he was going around different places like yeah. nanog and just trying to pe preach to people on network automation and people were like uh giving him the 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 blank look right and um yeah. no funny you mentioned pro because i did start with pro too but it never made sense to me man I, i'm i admire you for for how, learning it i mean i have friends who were who swear by it until this day and they were using pro for really large scale service provider network automation and they're that abstraction layer where they don't even touch like this was 12 years ago right so back then it was just a new thing nobody knew about it but they were able to you know automate hundreds of devices through pearl talking to um it wasn't it, it wasn't our rd tool but it was like this simple um configuration backup Rents it, I think. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And then they were just, you know, text files. They were talking to it. And they were able to make an actual business case for it, right? Like they were able to scale out uh, without scaling up, right? Yeah. So it's the same five engineers. So anyways, I knew all about these benefits of Perl, but I could just never hack it. I had this learning Perl book, right? Yeah. <laughs> On my desk. Every time I would open it and I, every time I felt like I made some progress, I get you know pull away do something else i come back i start from you know page one again because yeah. that's just the never stuck in my brain you know it's funny to me it's like you know like um I, um I, and i always think about this and you know within network to go we have people that different you know uh they learn different everyone learns differently right sure uh, and and i i will always say like I, i'm not not that i don't read documentation but i'm not a documentation reader to learn I learned by examples and mm -hmm. I, and Pearl was great for that for me because it's just like, it wasn't too stringent on like a lot of things you could just use like, <laughs> at, you know, like, and I didn't like, you know, eventually I'm realizing this is a right, it's a hash, but I didn't even know what it was. And like, I, I, the first few times, like I was probably five, six years into it before I realized that you could use a hash and I built my own hashing system by iterating over multiple arrays. Yeah. Because I didn't like, I didn't understand, you know, what 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 all was going on. But it, it's very forgiving for that, and yeah. you can still get things done. And so for me, it was just kind of, you know, it was natural. And then to to go to the more opinionated Python at first was actually kind of tough for me. Yeah. Um, but but to be honest, I always say this too, though, which is, Perl to me was the right tool then because everything was in Perl. You know, mm -hmm. like yeah. net session and like all, all these things. You know, switch my like. All these tools were built there. You know, um, it, everything was on SourceForge. There was no, you know, even Git at first when I was, you know, you know first really getting into this. Uh, and then Git, GitHub itself wasn't like the the place to be for for the first decade I was I was doing this. So, um, and I probably I didn't catch on to that until a few years even after that fact. Um, you know that this whole ecosystem was being built out. You know, so. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, to me, it's kind of very similar. You know, I know there's always talk, you know, Golang and Python and, and <laughs> you know, and, and Rust and, you know, whatever else the case may be. But sure. to me, it always just comes back to like, I, I, I'm always just looking to get the job done and move on to the next thing. Right. Right. You do it the best you could. Right. Yeah. yeah it, it, and it's just like, I just want to make things easy for myself. You know, like I know it, it, it's like, it sounds simple when you say like, I just want to make things easy for myself. But to me, it's really just about, you know, um, I have this, you know, I, I want to do this thing and um, this tool is here and it's going to make it quick for me. Yeah. So that's the news. I'm going to move on, you know. Now, I, I'll quickly change my mind if like the entire Golang ecosystem is built and, you know, I'll thank those trailblazers for, for doing that. But right. that's well, not... NTC could be one, right? Well, you guys are sponsoring yeah. all kinds of open source yeah. projects and <laughs> kudos. Yeah. So... 
But yeah, yeah so that's, how I, that's how I end up here. And then, you know, just just like watch them grow. Like there was just literally the two of us. And it's been, you know, kind of kind of, you know, growing out, you know, just and my role has changed tremendously. And, you know, I, I used to be, um, you know, in a very niche niche market known for like getting answering everyone's questions in Slack. Yeah. One of the reasons was is because I was always running like Ansel playbooks. Mm-hmm. waiting for it to run and to fail and i have <laughs> you know you know because inevitably you miss a variable or whatever you did <laughs> you miss uh, a space right here you go i'm sorry uh, yeah yeah we and, can't we can't execute that and i have 100 90, lines later yeah 100 yeah 100 tasks later like yeah exactly i have 90 seconds to wait and i could quickly like you know i can quickly context switch look at something answer the question and move back and like nothing is the wiser but like just to me to just look at the terminal while text is going, it's just like, no, you know, if I go check emails, I'll get invested in an email. But if I was just jumping between Slack, it was pretty, pretty clean for me to kind of move back and forth. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you mentioned about uh, how everybody learned different and you just want to get the tools and to get a job done. Right. So I, I remember, I remember thinking to myself about why is it that I always suck at pro? <laughs> like I just, so I'm, I'm always interested in that, right? Like how, how, how do I learn? So then I can learn something better and, and use the right tool for myself, right? Like there's 10 other excellent tools and, you know, they're all very powerful, but how do I pick the one that's right for me? So I actually was very into that. And I went to this language summit where they have the, uh, the founders of not, not the founder, but like the creators. So Larry Wall was there. Guido okay. Van Rossum was there and the creator of TypeScript and so on, just because it's Seattle, right? Like yeah. Microsoft's like sponsor all these kinds of stuff. So I think, you know, my, Larry Wall being like a linguist and uh, Guido being a mathematician background. So Larry Wall is always like, uh, you know, that it here is after him and there's always multiple ways to do th- th- one thing. And you're trying to find that most beautiful way. It doesn't mean your way is wrong. So yeah. it's, it's always like, you know, the Pearl one liner that drives me nuts, man. Like, oh my God, you're trying to find 10,000 different ways to do the same thing. And we're like arguing what's the best way to do it. I don't care. I just want to get it done. And preferably uh, for something like Python, like for you, Ken and me, if we're kind of at the same level of proficiency in Python, in theory, we should independently come up with the same solution, right? Because there's one best way to do it. And in terms of, uh, scalability in terms of multiple people working on a large project, I yeah. think that's invaluable. And it, for me, that is the that is the the drivers, the the maintainability, the readability. But I think the something to take away from this is, um, you know, you could you could suck like me, but <laughs> you, and you could like succeed at the end. You just haven't found the right tool for you, right? And then you could be like Ken, who's well versed in multiple things no, it, and it, is it, always it, successful. So. <laughs> It's quite the opposite too, because like, um, you know, and, and I think a lot about this, like, um, yeah, I, I did not learn, like I, I was generally speaking, able to figure out solutions to the problems at hand, mm-hmm. but that always caused me to not look for best practices. Right. I see. I see. And I was in a world like you're talking about, you know, when we, when we talk about scalability and, and it's a great question. I always like ask, ask when, when someone says, Oh, is it scalable? It's like scalable. How? And, and yeah. to me, you're saying developmentally scalable. Can you, have large teams. And I was just, as like I said, I was just a scripting guy on the side. I was, it was just for myself. So only I had to understand it, but no, it, it would have, it, it did fall apart. Like I was, um, you know, I got gone back to, to, to my, my old company and just, and like, Oh, we have this inventory problem. I'm like how I saw that problem. Like it was perfect. I had daily jobs and, <laughs> but you know, in fairness to them, it was my bad pro code. Only I knew how to run and it just died the day I left, you know? Yeah. And so to your point, like no, no, nothing, I probably never, I mean, you know, you could go look at my, my GitHub and uh, see some of my old Perl code and it's, um, it's poor. And I, I was literally, you know, maybe a year or two just looking at, just absolutely laughing at myself because <laughs> not realizing that I didn't keep things dry and, you know, simple things. It's just like, now that I understand the best practices, I, it, it's much easier to apply them, but yeah. Um, but that's all part of the growth, right? And you know, it's if you if you go back to your code and you can't find anything wrong with it, that just means you haven't grown. Yeah, every six months, I say every six months you're gonna look back and just say, oh, why would I do this? And and, and I'll, I'll give people a hint here. And um, you know, if you do want to learn a lot, like um, you know, join a startup with where it's just you and Jason Edelman, and you could just. <laughs> 
every three seconds <laughs> and bother him and say, why is this? What's going on here? You know? Yeah. I, uh, but I remember something yeah, you said, though. <laughs> I remember something you said about uh, when we when we met each other at Ansible Fest, you were saying the biggest. So, I, so my question to you was, hey, what's your biggest challenge right now? Right. Like, what do you face and what's the biggest challenge for growing uh, whatever this thing, uh, this startup that, that you guys are trying to do? And your answer was the biggest challenge for you right now is to make the customer realize Network to Co is more than Jason. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned. I was wondering, go and um, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and it's interesting. And, and you know, and kudos, kudos to Jason, you know, for this. Where you know, just he, he always took that approach of like, it's not me, it's never to code. Like, it's yeah. not called Edelman Corp or something like that, right? <laughs> it's never to code, and it's a brand, and it's its own thing. Yeah, and, you know, um, you know, ironically, I, I will sometimes hear from from people like, you know. Um, it's not just Ken, right? Like, and so th th those yeah. things shifted um, depending. And, and we, we, you know, he has instilled in me um, to always, you know, to always take that approach. We are coming because at, at then it's just like, if this one person leaves or they can't be on your project anymore, there's nothing there. So it's what is network to code, network to code recommend. Um, but yeah, no, you know, it, it, and, and, you know, like I said, you know, kudos to Jason, every, you know, everyone comes and goes, yeah, everyone tells me how they know Jason. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, either they know him or he knows thousands of people because uh, <laughs> uh, I've heard that from, 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 from a lot of folks. Um, right. But yeah, that, that's, you know, it has been a mantra and we talk about that a lot, you know, especially on my team, I kind of talk to people about it and it's just like, um, it, it's not for me to just come up with you know, recommendations or this, it, it's for us. Right. And, yeah. and to have, um, and, 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 you know, that goes back, you know, my, my role now is just, it's so much more about methodology. Like my, my programming is just pretty much at night now, you know, it came, <laughs> yeah, nice. it, that's, that's my role. Right. Like, you know, yeah. and, and like so, about 10, 10 minutes, you're going to go fire it up your uh, co-editor and just do some coding because you don't get to do that day, day time. <laughs> you know, and so I, I, I do, I get, I still get excited. I, I think I always be, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I talk internally and I always be excited to, to build these solutions and so forth. And, um, you know, application dictionary, goal and configuration, like, I, I, you know, uh, you know, Dolt, you know, done some things there. And um, I, I, I love that. I love evangelizing that. And I love being a part of like the, 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 the deep tech of it. But, but my day to day is just, it's not that anymore. And it, it is all about methodology. Yeah. And exactly what you said, like, it's just one of those things I talk about often, which is, uh, you know, m make sure that, just even the terminology, use we and us and, and, and so forth, you know, because, um, you're representing us. And so, you know, if you're making recommendations, you are making recommendations on, on behalf of Network mm -hmm. to Code. So, right, right. And I think that counts. I mean, that's always been, I think, from the day, from the first time I talked to Jason, it's never uh, sway from that, right? Like he's always yeah. trying to build something bigger than the sum of all of the people. So part of that is, you know, referring to we versus me and you know bring other people around and when you make recommendations it's always the team which is great because i mean i know i referred a few customers to you guys and they always come back and say yeah you know that's there they have a team approach it's always like you know you talk to one of us you talk to all of us and we're trying to bring the best practices to you yeah and that's really yeah and, and you know um I, I, one of the other things i talk a lot about with, with folks and you know, we're just constantly bringing on people now and, um, you know, m nearly everyone goes to the same journey, which is very similar to me, which is just like they, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm this, this scripting person. I'm this person who, um, has been doing all these great automation things on my own. And now you come in and, and, and it's a very different, different way of working. Right. And so yeah. you're used to like, I need to brute force this thing. Right. The only way through this is to figure it out, to brute force it. Mm hmm and then it turns where it's just like, oh, you literally have a whole team of people that are and they're willing to help. And, and one thing I always talk about is, um, you know, open source people, like network engineers that are open source minded, are different personality wise by and large than network engineers. A lot of the, you know, like the, you know, the, the stereotypical, you know, um, you know, gray beard network engineer types, they were holding on to me, or they are holding on to information. Mm -hmm this is my data center. You don't touch that data center, you know, and it's just the opposite. We're like, you know, the average person 
uh, in the open source world. And, and, and I, you know, I think I could, it's safe to say everyone there with the code is just like, they want to find out how can we get this code out open source. And, you know, there's disappointment when the customer says, no, this is, this is our code, which is, you know, totally fair, you know, yeah. uh, but, but that is something that, you know, um, so they want their code to be out there. They want to share to the world and show to the world what, what they've done. Um, so, you know, very different mentality wise overall. Yeah, no. And, and I think it shows in the approaches that you guys have taken, you guys have taken uh, a few open source projects and obviously right from the start, you're aggregating. Uh, let me pull up this page for people who is able to watch the YouTube uh, video. So, you know, very five years ago, six, uh, what is it? Five years ago was your first commit, right? Like you put together from Network to Code in this repository, awesome network automation, uh, you know, all these resources and these communities and events and trainings that, I mean, you don't get paid for this, no. <laughs> but you went ahead and, and pulled these uh, resources together, right? So, and also, you know, you guys uh, sponsor Nautobot and uh, all these other open source uh, technologies. Obviously, you know, you encourage Adam to openly share uh, he, what he had learned about, you know, testing and using PyTest and networking contacts. So, yeah, no, I agree. I think I think the mindset is very, very different at uh, Network to Code versus, you know, maybe some of the more traditional thought thought context. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, it, it, it's very um, self fulfilling prophecy because yeah, people out there, right? It's it's not just you know there are the Kirk buyers of the world, and you know these are uh, and, and again, you know, like we could technically look at Kirk as a competitor, but but but, but we talk, and he's just you know just one of those great people, and because he does have that similar mindset of like you know, give out, but give back to the community, right? Like right. He does a lot for the community. And, and so we're finding people that want to do that. And thus they want to come here. And it just becomes, like I said, very, very self-fulfilling. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like a bar raiser, right? Like at, at, at Amazon, we always talk about bar raiser. Like the next person you come in should raise the bar, everybody. Of course, it's kind <clears throat> It becomes proportionally harder, right? When you have two yeah. people, it's okay. You know, it's very it's yeah. very easy to raise that bar. But when you have a thousand, how do you raise the average of a thousand people by just bringing one person? So it's kind of a myth than like actual is, practice, yeah. right? But like you said, it's you're always looking for that awesome guy who matches your mentality as yeah. well as you know coming in and share that and just bring at the same time bring everybody up. Yeah. And that's, you know, you, you had Adam on here and that, that's just a perfect example. Just an awesome guy. Just like so, someone you want to work with, you know, someone that's super quick and, you know, j just embodies that, you know, what, what, what we love to see out there. Nice. You know? Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to ask you one last question about like backgrounds uh, because I, I'm very interested in hearing that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm a geek like you, so we're going to talk about, I promise to the listeners, we'll talk about application <laughs> delivery, uh, actually application dictionary in time. <laughs> but I want to ask this one last question because I know after the Air Force, you spent nine years at McKinsey, right? And that's a very prestigious position. Coming <laughs> up from, you know, where like kind of the same era that I grew up in, I know all of my friends wants to go work for the big <laughs> seven, big five, and, yeah. you know, the uh, uh, the Ernst and Youngs of the world, right? So like how, how did you decide? It, it was almost like, nine years you should just be there and retire right? yeah, yeah, yeah. but you you decide to to do this thing that was pretty risky at the time and still probably still more risk than than a, a more established company yeah yeah so i, I you know again to, to go back to the first thing i said is um i always have to like clarify because i can't take credit where you know um so i'm not i was not a mckinsey consultant i work for mckinsey and i work like yeah. in the it department so okay um, you know, and, and, and if you're in Manhattan and, and you, you talk to someone and you say McKinsey, like they literally will have a different thought of you if you're <laughs> so, um, in instantly have a halo. Uh, well, on yeah, their head. <laughs> like, I've literally gotten that. And then I you know, explained to me, oh, that makes sense. I was like, OK, you know, fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, but no, but 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 McKinsey was, you know, w was amazing in terms of like they give you literally you get the same benefits, same benefit structure that you know, the consultants get and stuff like that. So right. it, it was, you know, great, you know, uh, you, you know, well, well paid, you know, just everything was, uh, was great about it. But, um, you know, for me, it, it, it was like, um, two things, uh, it really came down to, um, you know, the first thing is I always want to do something, but, um, especially then, you know, more, less so now, but, um, I did not have any of the skills required to build, 
an organization. Okay. I didn't, I, you know, like if you asked me to write SOW, I never ran an SOW before. If you asked me, you know, like just to go through all the legal terms and stuff like that. And so just, and I didn't have any, you know, I also didn't have any of the network to go and sit there and say, Hey, you know, um, I didn't know Eric. I didn't know, you know, like, you know, Kirk, I didn't know anyone. Right. So I knew the few, um, you know, SEs and, you know, SAs, whoever that came around for accounts. I know there are yeah. a few people that worked through through the years, but you know, you're talking a few dozen people and you know, I, I wasn't marketing myself, nothing. Right. You know? Um, and then the, the reality for me is, um, you know, I looked at it and said, here's the four things that can happen. You know, it's, it's the matrix of like, either I go or don't go. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is, you know, never to code is successful or it's not successful. By the way, that's a very McKenzie thing to do. You're, <laughs> you're four quadrant. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, well, you learned yeah. something there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I learned a lot, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. But, um, so I, and I just said the one area I could not deal with is not going in order to code succeeding. Mm. I just couldn't live with that. Like that yeah. would have eaten me alive. Know that I could have been at something ground level. Yeah. And then I just said to myself, um, and I, I always advocate for this to other people. It's like, trust in yourself. Like yeah. just believe in yourself that, you know, and for me, it was like the belief that if I'm there, I'm going to help this organization grow. Yeah. It was belief. If it doesn't go well, I'll find another job. There are other mm-hmm. jobs out there. Yeah. And, you know, I always, you know, and, and again, you know, it, it was, um, it was not a financially wise decision, you know, for, you know, um, for, for a long time, you know, like it yeah. was, yeah, I can uh, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, you know, it, it, met many, many people, you know, not, not nefariously, but they'll, they'll second guess that you're going to go, you're going to just, just, who is this guy? What is he? You know, and, and, yeah. and I'll say now, like it, it was, you know, it might as well have been on the, on the back of a, of a cocktail napkin, you know, what, what we signed, right? It, it, we didn't go to lawyers. <laughs> it, it was always a handshake deal, yeah. right? Like, the, yeah, there's a document or whatever, but there was, my lawyer didn't review. He the lawyer, did, you know, and um, but to to both of our, you know, both of our credit, um, it was we never broke stride from that. Like nothing changed, nothing, you know, no, nothing changed whatsoever. So um, yeah, but that's interesting. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just double down on that and say, like, you know, I'll advocate for everyone. Like, if you believe in yourself and then believe in yourself, go and take yeah. the risk. You know, like there, you know, calculate risk. Don't just you know, but you know there are other jobs and, you know, um, you know, the, the, the immediate money right this second isn't always as important as whether it's the skills, the, um, the mar- the marketing or the community to, to meet other people, to just give yourself opportunities to do different things. And you know, I was just never going to have opportunities to do anything other than just another like enterprise job, essentially. Right. Right. No, I, I like that. I like that answer very much. I think, um, all of us would face, I mean, you, if you do play your cards right, right, like you, you learn and you always grow, you are always in tech, you will always face some sort of decision or some sort of um, crossroads where you decide to go uh, the more established route or, you know, you want to experience something differently. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just up to what you choose, right? So for me, yeah. you know, before I joined A10, um, I've always wanted to go through the IPO experience, right? Yeah. Like, I, I may not want a to work for, a, you know, somebody just working out of the college and before Series A. Yeah, I, I do. I do want to go through, you know, like the IPO experience and live through their excitement and the hype and see how it goes. And so that was that was an experience for me. And of course, uh, you just mentioned your thought process. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> no, no, it, it's um, yeah. It, 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 and the thing is, for me, I remember like it was literally a year, you know, uh, and ironically, you know, I'm, um, you know, as this is recorded, you know, I, I just hit six years. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Years ago. And I remember hitting a year and just saying, it doesn't matter what happens from here on out. Like it just it doesn't mm. matter because to me, I had already made it in a sense. It's like I'd already had a larger network. I'd already like, you know, I learned more in that year than I had in the previous nine years, like any, you know, any, you know, any year, any two or three years. Yeah. Just because it's so fundamentally different. You know, it, it was just like, I was going from like, okay, you learn a VPN. You learn that in a week or two. Like, it's not like it's, you know, like it, it's not a big deal, but it's just like literally learning all best practices, all these tools, all this stuff, you know, and then, 
And then, you know, for me, my personal journey is beyond the tech in terms of just thinking about business, being, thinking about the go-to-market plan, you know, everything else that gets layered on, like how to grow an organization and all the other fun stuff. So, yeah, no, perfect. Right. And now from two people and now you're, you're VP and how big is your team? Um, I think in the last QBR, my team was, um, I think we had 36 or 38 in oh, there. Oh, wow. Wow. And it's, it's amazing. It's grown, it's grown, it's grown since then. And, you know, we have some, some, some people coming on and, um yeah it, it, it's only growing so nice nice congrats man i mean i'm happy for you i think that <laughs> excitement of just just rapid growth like you could feel like it's almost like you know you look at your bicep grow it's like oh man you grew two <laughs> yeah, inches yeah. today man yeah. no, look at that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now yeah. you check yourself out in the mirror every time you walk through like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you know so it's, it's almost like that intellectually go ahead no, I just say, um, you know, and 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 um, you know, you're you're one of those people, like, um, you know, I, I would say, the distribution in the community is probably the same as distribution in the world, which is like, eighty percent of people are just good people, whatever. Twenty percent of people are just kind of stirring up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of those those eighty percent are just just good people, and you know, just kind of happy to see other things, and you know, like, um, just kind of, uh, yeah, um, you know, always always appreciate you and. And many, many others like yourself, but um, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, typically, I I can't wait to start talking about technical stuff, but it's like, <laughs> ah, man, it's so fun to, to listen to your journey and listen to, um, like I said, I feel like I followed the NTC path for a long time. So it's fun to kind of have, you know, it's not even inside baseball, but it's just you know, kind of pr different perspective, right? Somebody who's been there and trying trying this out, but. We do have to go, you know, <laughs> our main objective, the application dictionary. So let's talk about, you know, this blog. And I'm going to pull up your blog on the screen for people who's able to see it. Um, so you wrote this blog called Application Dictionary. And admittingly, back in, uh, I mean, back in July 2020, and admittingly, you said, I have a hard time trying to kind of phrase and put into context. So can you tell us a little bit about what you mean? Like, what is the problem space? What's the problem set you're trying to solve? Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll start with just kind of like, you know, talk through a typical firewall rule, you know, created. Yeah. And, Please. and, and um, so I, I'm, I'm an application guy and, you know, I, I follow the docs and it says to, you know, um, you know, kick off my, you know, HPUX service or my whatever new application, you know, um, uh, and I run it in production, not production, no problem. Right. And I'm, a, I'm in my own AWS VPC and there's no issues. And then I want yeah. to bring production into the, the, the corporate environment. I just want to work. Right. It's, I just want to work. And of so I find out I have to put a firewall request in and I, I don't care about that. I just wanted to work. <laughs> just wanted to work. And then, what do you mean? Everybody should know about you know TCP ports uh, and it, it, yeah, it, you know how to how to the priority of your rule sets. But correct. Yeah. And then oh, on the flip side, the person you know. So I, I get my Excel document and that says for how to put it in, and I just say you know must work right. I don't fill in the forms and I use names of my. You know, uh, my you know like Hercules is my server name or whatever it is. Right. I put IPs. I don't put. It's not even real DNS. It's just like a local name to me. And just and then on the flip side of that is the the person receiving it, and they go, "How do they know how another application works? Right? They don't know anything? They don't even know that it's their own app. You built it. How do you right. know how it works? Right? It was the top secret project. Now they just you know trying to announce at the launch tomorrow, and then now the <laughs> application exactly. the writer is like. Hey, Steve Jobs is going to be on the stage, and we need to have this, <laughs> yeah. you know, iTunes store pass through. <laughs> and there's, you know, you know, and, and me as an application developer says, I don't understand. It was just so simple, and, and now it's so complicated. Yeah. Um, and you know, completely, you know, and, and it's really important to take both perspectives, yeah. right? One perspective is as a security person, I'm responsible for ensuring this is, you know, locked down, and and you know. Um, being conscious of security for the entire for the entire organization. Of course, of course. As a patient person, it just wanted to work. It works simple when I do it. When I control everything, it's just super simple. 
But whenever I got to talk to you, it's super complicated, right? Yeah. And my favorite bit, it's like, can I just escalate this to your manager? That's it, it's yeah. like, it doesn't really matter. You could talk to my boss's boss's boss. Yeah. You still have to give me the IP address. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, and so again, so if you look at both perspectives, it, it, it's you, you can become empathetic to both sides. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so the whole point of this is, well, what do we care about? Right. We care about the relationships between applications. And so that is saying my front end needs to be able to talk to my app layer. My app layer needs to be able to talk to my SQL you know, server or cluster, right? Sure. And as an application person, I could speak in those terms, Yeah. right? Now, if I write that in a, in a, in a you know, in notepad and send it over, it's like there's just all this investigation work, right? Yeah. So let's call that part one. Um, <clears throat> well, let's say that's, part, that's like kind of like, the, the, like, you know, setting up the problem. Sure. If we look at new, you know, um, uh, new ways of deploying configuration, it's you know, from a source of truth, infrastructure as code, and just kind of having a source of truth, right? Yeah. And so if we think about, well, what is, you know, what a firewall rule, you know, what does a firewall rule source of truth look like? Well, you can go and sit there and say, um, well, I want, I, you can carry on the same process, which is. I have, you know, 10.1.1, you need to talk to 10.2.2 over, you know, port 80 or, you know, 443, whatever it may sure. be. Sure. <clears throat> but what if we turn that paradigm on its head and sit there and say, we're going to define applications. Yeah. And then define the relationships between applications. Mm -hmm. Then the firewall rules become simply uh, the, the configuration artifact of that data, mm -hmm. right? And you can mm -hmm. start to do a lot of interesting things, right? If you separate firewall rules from, from the data, and some of those things include things like um, having a single policy engine, right? Yeah. Means if I'm blocking something, you know, at closest to the source or closest to the destination, do yeah. I really need to touch every other device in between? Yeah. Right. And, and we do now because those domains like so if, if I'm using my uh, VMware firewall, I don't trust those people. I don't see into that system. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use my East West, you know, uh, you know, uh, firewall, not the VMware, which is on the host level. Right. Right. Because you don't have access or visibility or even understanding of it. And I definitely don't trust another organization. You know, they're the same organization. <laughs> The server team yeah. even puts in requests that like they don't know their source and destination, so I definitely don't trust them, right? Yeah. And now when they do happen to know, when they when they when you know some people in there they say I, I already blocked this, there's nothing's going to happen, right? Yeah. So well, if I if it's just an artifact, I could build that custom business logic that understands things like oh don't worry about it, just keep it wide open four four three eighty across, you know through the data center because. All my hosts are going to be blocked. All of these hosts are going to be blocked locally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't need to build those same firewall rules on every different system. Or maybe I just sit there and say, oh, once I know that this one IP is controlled by VMware's you know, firewall system, yeah, I could just allow that IP, anything to that IP through the data center because I trust the other system, right? right. So it's not stitching the rule one at a time right mm -hmm. it's not stitching the rule you know you directly that another great thing you could do is something like um compression of rules right okay. yeah so i sit there and say <clears throat> um my application is needs access you know to the snmp server right and from the snmp server uh so the snmp um uh so what i would normally do as a firewall rule i would say Okay, super cool app needs access. Your, you know, uh, sorry, the SMP server needs access to super cool app. So I build a rule that says that. Right? Yeah. Well, hold on. It's always the same thing, right? It's just SMP out to all these different systems. Yeah. So from the data, the source of truth data, I can apply, once again, apply a business logic and sit there and say, well, don't build the rules every one line to one application. Because I'm not looking at the firewall rule to understand each communication path. I'm looking at the source of truth to understand all of that, right? Right. And so again, you can can compress compress those 
uh, those firewall rules. Again, because it's just, it's just an artifact. It's a configuration artifact of the data. No different than infrastructure as code where you don't have every single line of configuration. I, I am advocating a bit for um, uh, some, a bunch of business logic, which would, you know, it's going to take some time to kind of, you know, fully optimize all these things. Right, right. But yeah, I, think, I think what what the proposal, as you as you mentioned, was you build a layer on top of just the procedural stuff, right? Like you want to be more declarative. All I want is I want to declare uh, SNMP monitoring uh, to be true, and Correct. then and then like what does that true mean? And uh, so that means you know you have to have these stuff that happening between your source and destination. But there are multiple points within that path that you could apply to. Maybe it's on the uh, the VM's uh, own IP table. Maybe it's on the firewall or whatnot. And those are abstracted away from the both the app, maybe both the application as well as the operator, because underneath you you each have your domain knowledge. So the VM, you know, I don't know, VMware manager uh, could be the one who's you know uh, exerting the domain knowledge to how to do that, or it could be your network operator who is putting that into the firewall role. Exactly, exactly. And that, that's even just in that, just just think about it from like the cross domain aspect of it, right? Yeah. Just, just the idea that you could have both, you know, Palo Alto's and ASA's on one side, and then the other side have IP tables and VMware and, you know, Kubernetes services and, 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 and so forth. Um, but I was actually, you know, it's funny that you, you just took off. I was going to say, you're right, probably a good point. And maybe it'd be good to, if you pull that blog back up, yeah, I'll just for sure. walk, walk through and just kind of talk through like a workflow here. If yeah, for down, sure. So on the left-hand side, it's like I am announcing a, a service, right? So that's what's in blue here, Okay. right? Uh, I believe it's blue. Uh, it's, yeah, it I, is. So okay. uh, so for people who's listening, we have pull out. I mean, I'll, I'll include this in the, uh, in the show notes, but essentially we have the application owner and the first stage was the application identification. That's what you have there. And right. it's a bunch of blue. Then it's like, you know, uh, CRM, it's DB, it's the app, and so on. Yeah. And so you're defining there the IPs with uh, the, 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 what they're announcing, right? Like I'm, I'm announcing this protocol out there. Or I'm announcing my intention to um, connect over, you know, uh, this, this protocol, mm -hmm. right? And then on the other side, it's well. Um, so just just picture a world where um, you know day one the LDAP, you know like ADD, um, the Active Directory administrators, you announce LDAP, and everyone needs to have access to it, right? Well, they're just saying my application needs access to LDAP, not yeah. my application needs access to you know ten dot one twenty dot two hundred dot zero slash twenty four over you know three eighty nine uh, or, or you know. Uh, w whatever it is, right? Yeah. So you're whatever just, port. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So you're just simply saying, I want to access that. But in day one, the LDAP person defines their service, and then people add to it, right? And if they sit there tomorrow and say, "Well, the definition of LDAP in America is, is different," well, so does the configuration change with it, or they expand it. So there's yep. a configuration that's applied to it from. And then the other side is, is, is just that, it's that requester, right? So if, if I'm developing a new application, I'm going to be doing both of these, right? I'm mm -hmm. going to first say, you know, my super cool app is out there. I'm defining it and it's a, you know, it's a three tier app and, you know, I have Apache in the middle, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> I announce all my services. Then I stitch together and say my, you know, my, my application layer needs to talk to the database layer. My front end needs to talk to the application, you know, whatever that may be, right? But yeah. I'm defining the service. And so in the future, anyone else can use that service uh, definition as well, right? Yeah. And then you could, you know, you could start getting to the point where it's, um, um, uh, you could say like, well, that the LDAP person does not care who's going to use a service. So he does, they, they don't want to be anywhere in, in path of like approvals, right? They don't really care. It's just LDAP as a service we offer to everyone. If you're right. on the network, you should have access to LDAP, right? That's just the way it goes. Um, yeah. Whereas someone that says, like, you know, owns a financial app, they may say, no, 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 you're, you're not allowed to access. You're not getting direct access to our database unless you have a good reason for that. And they could insert themselves to say, from a network, you know, uh, layer, we could actually be, insert ourselves into that that kind of approval chain 
right? Not just with usernames and so forth. You can't even get access to, you know, uh, you know, over the network to it, right? Mm -hmm. But and then then it, you know it would of course go through the standard security thing, right? Like saying, okay, from my my office, I should not have direct access to the database, right? And that should kind of you know key off, um, you know, something is is not going uh, as expected, or you know, someone's asking for something they don't actually need or or want or whatever whatever the, the case may be. So, um, but. It, in this, it, it really is just simply a play around uh, intended states, you know, infrastructure as code, and how to model appropriately uh, applications, right? And there's yeah. just a whole series of, and I think I kind of, um, I think I define, um, you know, some other things here, like some other kind of, um, yeah, I, I already kind of talked about uh, uh you know, some of these, but just like, you know, uh, how does the system differentiate between applications, you know, they're secured by firewalls, IP tables, container, container orchestration, or whatever the case, but there's all these other side benefits of just knowing your applications, right? You know, in, in, in many enterprises I, I, I was at, they had no idea. Applications were a server underneath some guy's desk, right? That's what the application is, right? And so if you control it, you know that you can't get access to that because it's not going to be just some random IP that's not verified. It's like, no, you need to go through some governance system to onboard mm -hmm. your application and, and, and then to kind of, kind of deploy it from there. Right, right. I mean, I've seen various uh, bits and pieces of this model in different companies, right? Yeah. So I've had one instance where, you know, we have uh, firewalls that separates two different environments and that rule just gets longer and longer and longer and by the thousandth you know line nobody remembers what you know 10.1.1 was right so at the very top and so now you're afraid to take that out so you essentially just keep on adding new stuff in even if those become stale and decommissioned and so on um so what what we've done was you know like the tagging of it is that now we define um, you know, server fleets and, you know, for, I'm, I'm not sure if people, some people are familiar with this, but maybe not everybody is that most, most large scale application nowadays is a fleet of servers, right? It's not just one server. It's not just, it's a bunch of servers in, in lo different geographic locations because of redundancy and so on. So now they're tagging everything and that's up to the application owner to tag it and say, my servers in the US are this IP. And if they decommission it because of cloud or because of VMs, they're responsible for updating that IP and those tags still valid, right? Like, so that's kind of your uh, application identification, but that still comes down into a, a homegrown tool that, you know, that very specific on this set of IP, uh, firewall rules. And I've been in other companies where uh, they have more of a developer mindset and they just said, F this, right? Like we're just going to have every single application owners. So they, they, yes. they make yes. the network just as a, a dump pipe and just like you just pass everything. And each of the application owners are responsible for defining their own rules. Yeah. And then, so all the rules are as close to the source as possible, but it becomes a management nightmare to have a, the information view. Yeah, the data is so distributed. You yeah, have, and you can you can like um, uh, mine all the Git repositories you have if you understand all the logic, right? But it's exactly so, you know, and, and and you know, you know, I, I've been around long enough to go through the centralized, decentralized, you know, um, you know, kind of mantra a, a, a few times now. But um, this is one area where I don't think decentralization because you lose control of your security footprint, and right. I've honestly seen in many organizations where, you know, the networking team has no idea what's going on in the AWS cloud. Like they, they have, <laughs> no there is no kind of um, understanding of, you know, um, an application developer who doesn't understand the implications just opens up an internet, you know, IGW, and now that is the attack vector for everything. And right. you know, it's so easy to get to, to get lost. And it's actually a great point that you mentioned though too, just to just to cover on is. 
you know, I, I'm doing things in IPs and this is definitely geared towards network engineers, right? Like, you know, right. when we write a network to code, um, we really take the mindset of a, of a network engineer and how do they think about the world? And we really try to take that. But the reality is, is you could use anything. You use Palo's EDLs. You could use, um, uh, you know, VMware's tags. You could use, you know, uh, Kubernetes service, you know, definitions, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it doesn't matter, right? That is just now you have to apply a whole bunch of business logic to make it, to, to make what I said really true, like that it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it's not trivial to just switch back and forth between an IP and a, you know, um, uh, um, a VMware tag. Sure. But you have the capabilities because it's just a data modeling system, right? And just trying to make this just do one thing very well, which is just be a data model for applications. And, you know, one of the other side benefits I neglected to mention is just rule ownership, right? You, you were talking about like, you just, no one wants to take anything away. Like, yeah. And, and I, I developed a system, um, you know, which is kind of like the genesis of this, you know, like maybe a, a, a decade ago, it, it really wasn't, it wasn't this elaborate. It wasn't this mindset. It was very much like, reverse engineering what was out there and then kind of you know applying ownership and stuff like that yeah um, but in in doing so i assigned rule ownership to it which was you know very important for this you know certification and this this that the other thing um and that is so crucial like most people like like if you ask 90 plus percent of organization do you track who owns rules the answer is, uh, is yeah yeah but the reality is is that tends to fall apart the moment you say, develop a report for me who owns all the roles in this firewall. <laughs> I'm not that, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's somebody put a service now ticket in that had a request, right? And they could search for this IP or this some attribute and try to guess what it is, but they have no idea what the history of that, that is, right? right they right. have no idea when that person who put the request in left that group, left the company, et cetera, right? There is no ownership and there is no reasonable way to assign ownership back to, to, to users without, I, you know, talk to, to customers where they said every three years, they could, they take like a year long audit and just to, to go through because of, you know, for compliance reasons. Yeah. Um, and that's how long it takes, right? Just to, to go through and just, you know, play network engineering detective to, to, to find out what is going on there. At the the login keyword, so then to see if that word was ever hit, or exactly. you know, first thing or, you do, right? It's first yeah. thing you do. And then the worst is is you can't even like sometimes the scanners hit it, so it gets hit. <laughs> you actually have to look at it, like, yeah. and then you know it's okay, less than a hundred, then I'll, I'll I'll take a look at it, and then you, you find oh, okay, but then even then, like, what what do you do when it's just like, well, this is dr for that that device it's not going to be hit, it's never intended to be. Yeah, hit. that's the tricky part it, because you don't have that logic. And, and, you know, so it's just like there, there's all these tangential benefits, anything, anything source of truth related. There's all this tangential ben benefits for having the appropriate metadata, right? Mm -hmm. and, and use cases you can't think of now that having that metadata later is going is, is gonna to help, right? Yeah, I like, I like how you phrase that, you know, uh, it all comes down to metadata because metadata provides more information on top of what just uh, it reminds me of, you know, the the four people who's touching the elephant only part of it so it's like the network person would, would touch the elephant's ear and then the the application would touch the elephant's nose or whatnot and then each of them comes up with different representation but this uh, mm. metadata is going to help each of them to piece together that whole thing so even though they may not be able to see the other parts they can at least be able to know who to talk to to uh to get that right Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And again, like the, the, it, it, it's, it's not unique to this, this, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 it's like many things like, um, you know, often talk, talk with customers about, um, well, you, you do network automation, do you do server automation? It's like, well, the reality is server network automation is really a descendant of, of, of networking or sorry, network automation is really a descendant of server, right? It's a DevOps, you know, it's right. like those principles and applying it. And it's no different in here. This is just a descendant of, of a source of truth. Right. If you understand what a source of truth and, and it's a slightly different take and flavor on it, but it's not, you know, wholly unique. Right. You know, I, I'm not coming up with new ideas around metadata. It's just simply these are the, the these are the, the principles and concepts that we're using in many places. Apply yeah. it for a specific 
use case, right? Which is, you know, you know, far, firewall and, and applications essentially. Right. Right. And I, I think right here, you also talk about, you know, there's some familiar, familiarity with some commercial product, but yet, uh, like you said, the concept is not new, um, but the yeah. application is what you're proposing the systems and methods to make it better. Um, and so on. Um, you know, can I, I know, you know, you're a busy guy, you have a hard stop, um, but I, I enjoyed our conversation very much. Can you tell people where they could find you on social? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll, uh, uh, let me pull this up. So you also, you could, I also include this link on wall, all the blogs that Ken had, uh, written on network to code blog. Yes, I do appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, put together a few over, over, over the last few years. Um, but yeah, so I, I always forget my actual spelling. So, um, but, <laughs> but I'll put the link there anyway. So, anyway, but it's, uh, uh, it depends net, uh, yep. on, on, get, get, on uh, Twitter. I think it's, it, yep. it depends network on, on GitHub. And uh, honestly, for the most part, like if, if I'm most often on the network to code Slack, we have yep. a fairly large community there and that's kind of, you know, where I hang out the most to say. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you know, you hit them up on join the network to co. I believe it's free, right? Like you yeah, said, yeah, free, yeah. Nice. So, um, and also I want, I mean, before you go, I want to ask, because this question always come up, you know, one form or the other, when I talk to kind of, I don't, I don't know, group more than five is how do people get started with network automation if they're interested in this? Yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll give maybe two answers. So one, sure. you know, one of the person my my team, a gentleman named actually, if you could go to the blog, Matt Vitelli. Uh, okay. I think we have. I'll try a, to find it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he put out a, you know a, a great series, maybe two or three articles um, around around exactly exactly this topic. Um, but to me, um, what I would say. Uh, you know, outside of that is, uh, you know, literally, you know, just like Nike, like Nike, just, just do it. Just, just get started. Okay. Uh, the, you know, I, I think of, I never got my CCE, but like you would always just spend all this time building a lab and this and that and, 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 and everything else. Um, when the reality is, is don't worry about that. Don't let that drag you down. Just get moving. Uh, yeah, if you, if you yeah, search on his name, you should probably see, um, but just get, just get moving, um, yeah. find a use case that you, you care about. Right. And it's one of the things we learned from even on the training side. Um, it's like, get people going as quick as possible, like leave the classroom and do something, right. Do something in your environment and, um, you know, um, don't conflate automation for configuration management. Um, there is, I, I often think configuration management, like the actual, let's call it configuration provisioning, maybe the, I don't want to say the least interesting, but, but it, it is third or fourth on my list in terms of, uh, <laughs> nice. uh, of, of interesting because even configuration generation, data management, you know, telemetry, like these things, you know, operational validation to me is just so much more important uh, than that. And so if you could just simply generate um, uh, configurations and manually apply them, that is a huge leg up and you could do that tomorrow, right? You can do operational validation, which is, uh, yeah, th there you go. Intro to automation part one, two, and three by, uh, Mr. Sure. Mr. Matt Vitale. Uh, but if you could just get going, um, tomorrow with operational validation and, you know, just think of like comparing show IPO SPF between you know, pre and post change. And you do that diff and like, you can't even see it because, um, there's the timer changes. Right. And you can't even see the delta between the two. It's like you're looking for like an A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, A pattern, which is like that's an, yeah. an add route or a move route or something like that. And it's impossible to kind of even compute. Turn yeah. that to structure data, remove the timers and then view that and build, build something there. And, and if you just get started, you know, things start start falling into place. They do start falling like dominoes. And there is a snowball effect there. So nice. That, that's right. Good. I, I, that's that's typically what I think uh, I would give people as well. Just just get started, find small wins, and yeah. you'll get much more motivated after that. So uh, I appreciate that answer very much. Yeah, you know, I, I will say, you know, like I, I don't want to get flame wars over tools and so forth, but I would say <laughs> with uh, Python or Ansible, simply because 
all the one, there's so much one-on-one content out there now, yeah. right? All the things, yes, they may be bleeding edge, but r- the reality is, is it doesn't matter. Like, you know, and, 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 and don't worry about, I, I say this to people, even with my group, like just because you built, you, you wrote some code that didn't make it into production doesn't necessarily mean it's not valuable code. What you learned in that is is invaluable. What what the you know what you learned not just like from your own like technical skills, yeah, about processes and within your own organization and so forth, right? But what's going to work? Where are people going to use? Where are they not going to use? This that the other thing. It's like, you know, I, I I built a lot of automation in 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 my day, and it wasn't until I kind of like start partnering with someone to say like, just sit with me, like explain what I'm doing wrong because no one's picking up my tools. They're awesome. I'm telling you, they're awesome. <laughs> but no one's picking them up and um he kind of like changed you know how i go about things and, and think about things and you know r- really kind of taking the user experience but i learned so much and i learned like and again it's not just you learning about pearl at the time it wasn't the pearl aspect it was learning about how to integrate with different systems how to have a you know have a reason to integrate with this api this token authentication w- whatever it may be yeah i like that um yeah i remember the <clears throat> the the mo the time that I learned most about like each steps of spanning tree is when I have to go program uh you know uh, learning switch from like open flow <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's it that's that's in depth I'm, I'm a hack compared to you then <laughs> <laughs> no 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 I, I was you know, I was dying right but but at the same time um you know you imagine like you have to usually you plug in it works but if you think about it it's like okay I need to keep track of the source of the pores that are coming in. I need to flood out all the other pores. I need to keep a state for that. Now I need to keep track of the one and then the only return, you know, all these other stuff. Right. So, yeah. um, so I absolutely second that, that you, you uh, idea. The, you can get to the point where you say, Oh, this is not the right programming language. And then right. still make the, I will still make the claim that you, you didn't lose much. No, 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 no. Plus, yeah. You're gonna, you know, the process of what you need to do, to, to, to do to do that right so it's like you know i hear people all the time it's like oh you know if we develop an ansible then we find out it's too slow it's like by and large you're gonna get very far in your journey before you really come most organizations before you really get to that to that point yeah um and then once you do it's like you actually know your problems if you go build this framework day one on without best practices without guardrails you're going to make a lot of bad decisions. And, and, and I, I would argue throwing out all that, that Ansible, you know, YAML file and rebuilding is actually cheaper and quicker than building, trying to build that perfect framework the first time. Yeah. It, it's just, you don't know enough about your system. You don't know where, like, you know, I actually, one of my blogs, I talk, kind of talk about, I think premature optimization is, is, is yeah. um, and it was just really, it was, it was a guess on like, um, you know, we, we just kept, you know, ran it, you know, just generate ginger files. And we got to the point where it's just taking too long to, to, to do. And it was like, I have two options here. One's going to take me 20 minutes. And the other is going to take me a long time. The one that took me 20 minutes it worked. And I, I never worried about it with that customer again. It <laughs> the problem. And I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to, but if I had sat there and said, how do I optimize this? How do I do this? I would spend a whole amount of time and not really have had an issue. Um, so, yeah, the premature optimization is the root of all evils. I think that's the <laughs> quote from yeah. my computer scientist. Uh, I forgot whom, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it in the notes. Okay. So thanks again, Ken. I appreciate the conversation. Thanks for taking the time. I uh, I will, you know, chat with you a little, in a little bit. Okay, great. Right. Really, great, great. I really appreciate it, Eric. Really appreciate the conversation. Likewise. So thank you for listening to the Network Automation Notes podcast today. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other podcast platforms. Until next time, bye-bye.